Mr. Beast is ridiculously transparent in interviews. I will literally come on here and tell you guys every little thing I know about getting views on YouTube. And I know thousands, tens of thousands of creators have watched those and literally, you know, that's the reason why they're making 10 plus thousand dollars a month because they're just like, oh, Jimmy just literally laid it out. Yeah, I just yeah. followed it. So I poured over as many Mr. Beast interviews as I possibly could. And I ended up with a lot of notes. And I mean a lot of notes. To save you the time of doing all that, I've compiled Mr. Beast's top advice into eight categories. Buckle your seatbelts and let's dive in. We'll start at the beginning with ideation. How do you come up with good video ideas? One thing that Mr. Beast has mentioned time and time again is that he works best off of inspiration. I work very well off of inspiration. Where does he get his inspiration? Mr. Beast has tried things like flipping to a random page in a dictionary or using a random word generator to find a word. After he has a word, he'll start coming up with ideas. Watch this in action here. Give me any word. I don't know. Make it space. Relative. Space. Yeah, like I went to space. You know, what happens if you blow up a nuke in space? Or I went to the moon. I went to Mars. Right? Because you said that one word, it was able to inspire me to come up with four ideas. This works well for a while, but Mr. Beast cautions against relying on it. Because at a certain point, no matter how many random words you're looking at, you're still drawing inspiration from that same base of knowledge. And that becomes dangerous when you start getting the same ideas over and over again. To mitigate this, Mr. Beast is very intentional about his information diet. Watch him talk about it here. My well of knowledge needs to constantly be expanding, so I have more things to draw inspiration from from our ideas. If not, you're going to get the same ideas over and over again. So it happens for a lot of creators. That's why their videos are repetitive and always the same thing. Because if you're not constantly learning new things, then your ideas are just limited to what's in your head and eventually you're going to drain it. That's how I've seen it. It's not so linear. Point is, I need to always be in taking things. So I have a team of people who are just helping just dump and beat new things in my head so I can get inspired. Mr. Beast has a whole team of people to teach him things, but if you're anything like me, you're out here doing this solo. That's fine. There are plenty of ways to keep teaching yourself new things, from keeping up with trends to following interesting Twitter and YouTube accounts. In order to apply Mr. Beast's video ideation framework, what matters is that instead of just scrolling through videos mindlessly, you set aside time to consume content with the intention to learn. So you're learning new things, you're getting inspired, and you're coming up with ideas. Great. But once once you have your list of ideas, how do you know if they're good? According to Mr. Beast, any video idea can go viral as long as it's interesting to the audience, original, and just good. Just good is a little broad, but thankfully Mr. Beast goes into more detail when he compares the idea of first to win a race wins 100 grand with the idea of first to climb a mountain wins 100 grand. I think running a race is like, people have done that, it's like, generic it's whatever but like first to climb mountain and like a thumbnail of someone climbing the side of a mountain and the thought of someone climbing a mountain is extreme like the that's adrenaline it's interesting like to me climbing a mountain is more interesting than running a marathon mr beast mentions similar criteria in other interviews as well when he looks for good ideas he looks for ideas that are original that no one's done before that are interesting to his audience and that are extreme once mr beast has picked an idea instead of jumping straight into creating the video he spends hundreds of hours yes hundreds of hours. First, thinking about the packaging. Yep, I'm talking about title and thumbnail. We'll start with titles. I'll let Mr. Beast take it away here because what he has to say about titles is pure genius. What makes for a good title? Short? Not just short. It's also, I mean, if someone reads it, are they like, do they have to watch it? Is it just so intrinsically interesting that it's just gonna f with them yeah. if they don't click on it? You know what I mean? Ideally, it's a title also that, um, you know, because the titles don't live in a vacuum, right? So it has to lead into the content. So ideally the title represents content that you would want to watch for 20 minutes. So if it's a 20 minute video and the title is, I stepped on a bug, it's not going to, because it's all of it combined. It's, it's, the click through rate is going to be much lower. And then if it was like a five second video, people might click it. So you got to like, even nuances of the length of the video based against the title will affect whether people want to click it. Because sometimes they just all add up. I mean, it's that. Yes, ideally you want it below 50 characters because above 50 characters on certain devices, you run the chance of it going dot, dot, dot. So like I took a, a light pole and I saw how many dollar bills I could stack on top and they would just go dot, dot, dot because it's yeah. too long yeah. and it can't finish it. And that's the worst thing because then people don't even know what they're clicking on. And so it's going to do even worse. Um, short, simple, ideally, and just so freaking interesting. They have to click and it is a good segue into the content and it represents the length of the content. You need something a original how to go viral is probably it's not something like super original you like you need a really strong Thanks. opinion probably like you need to say like like what you're saying is like i like bananas and what you need is bananas are the best goddamn food on the planet like 
that's the type of opinion you need. Like, you need something like how to get a hundred million views on YouTube, or not even that, that's not strong enough. You need something that makes people go, <laughs> what the fuck? You know, and like click, you know what I mean? This man is genius. And the concept of good titles being so interesting that people literally can't stop thinking about it, that they daydream about it later and think, God, I really need to know what happened, is something that Mr. Beast repeats across a number of interviews. So there you have it. In order to make titles like Mr. Beast, your titles need to be extreme, they need to be interesting to their audience, they need to be representative of the video link, and they need to be short enough so that they're under 50 characters to avoid the dreaded dot 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 on some devices. Hey, I'm still working on my titles. Sorry, Jimmy. After Mr. Beast has his title, he'll turn his attention to thumbnails. And this topic is one that's a lot harder to talk about. Mr. Beast often says that asking, how do you make a good thumbnail, is similar to asking, how do you cook good food? Because there are a ton of different factors and a lot of it depends on the specific video or thumbnail. So instead of talking generically about a thumbnail advice as a whole, Mr. Beast often asks to roast individual thumbnails instead. Here's an example. One of my friends, I was, I, he he just uploaded a video recently and I called him. I was like, what is this? Because he's a very, very smart guy. And in the thumbnail, he's <laughs> he's getting chased by cops, but the cops were wearing yellow vests. So they didn't look at cops. So I was like, well, why are the cops in your thumbnail wearing yellow vests? It's like, that makes it so much more boring. Yeah. And he was like carrying a, a flag, but the pole and the color of the flag were the same color. So it's like, it's a lot harder to see the flag. I was like, also you're wearing like a shirt with like five different colors. Like, okay. so it's like, it's hard to tell what even what your outline is and then in the background there were cars and i was like well if you have cops chasing you why not make the cars cop cars and you know and it's like because in my head i'm like dang if you just did those like four or five things the video probably would have got like seven x the views from that analysis we can pick up a couple of key thumbnail takeaways every element of your thumbnail should be distinct without blurring into each other or getting lost and every component of your thumbnail should be there for a reason and add to the story that you're trying to convey. And while Mr. Beast didn't like talking about thumbnail advice more generally, after watching interview after interview after interview, I was able to compile some more general thumbnail related advice he had. According to Mr. Beast, your thumbnail should work with your title to set expectations for your video, effectively get the viewer to feel some sort of emotion like curiosity, awe, surprise, etc. Be clear and simple with not much clutter, be brighter as opposed to darker, and have the ability where if someone is scrolling through their homepage and comes across your video, they're able to instantly understand the concept you're trying to convey. And if you want to make titles and thumbnails like Mr. Beast, make them before you even film a video. Mr. Beast explains why here. We usually sketch out the thumbnails. Actually, Chucky's somewhere in here. He does it for me. Uh, we sketch out the thumbnails beforehand to kind of see if we, we like it. Like one of our upcoming videos, we're gonna have people put their hand on a jet and then last take it off keeps it. And so it's like funny doing the little sketches of it like because we're trying to figure out how do you show a jet but also like show people because people are small and you gotta be able to see them. So we just get it where it's like, okay, this is good because a lot of people do the inverse, they film the video and then they realize, oh, I don't like the thumbnail, but you're in too deep, you already filmed the video. So you kind of just, you know, have to make do. Or I'd rather have that existential crisis before I film the video, that way. Uh, I can make changes. But sometimes making changes still isn't good enough. In those cases, well, I'll let him tell you. It seems like you would literally potentially shut down a video just because you can't come up with a good title. Yeah, or 100%, a good thumbnail. Or a thumbnail. Yeah, I mean, that's what happened to 70% of those in that pitch session. I was just like, oh, what was one of them? Genius versus 100 people or... Yeah, like maybe average intelligence versus genius, something yeah. like that. Or yeah, I was like, what the heck is the thumbnail? Even if the title was good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this... So many, but yeah, if people don't click, they don't watch. After Mr. Beast has his video idea and his title and thumbnail set, that's when he'll start working on the video itself. And when it comes to making videos, those first 30 seconds are make or break. So let's talk about how Mr. Beast approaches hooks. I know you know that hooks are important, but in a good number of his interviews, Mr. Beast takes the time to drill in that point even harder. So listen to the man. Everyone knows the basics. You hook people at the beginning, but I, we really should drill this home because like, if you look at any of your retention charts in any videos, you're losing like 30% of your viewers in the first 30 seconds. And then hopefully if your videos don't suck, they level off. But like, imagine if you only lost 15% of those viewers or 10%, you know, like the doing, the number one thing is like retaining as many people as possible at the start. Cause I like can envision 
a chart where you lose 35% of your viewers in the first 30 seconds, and then a vision one where you only lose 20%. That's 15% more people that are watching, you know, throughout the video than not. And it's not like you made the whole video like uh, a bunch better. You just had a more strategic intro that hooked them. And I'm struggling to put this into words and like to really impose how important that is. But like that 15% difference in viewership really does make the difference between hypothetically like 2 million views on a video and like 10 in my head. In that interview, Mr. Beast talked about the importance of hooks as it related to retention. But now with the adoption of YouTube's autoplay feature, hooks are playing a more crucial role in click-through rate as well. Mr. Beast explains why here. I heard you guys talking about um, autoplay on YouTube yes. and I've never considered it. I've always thought about the thumbnail, but now on YouTube, videos automatically play. Yeah, here, let me show you the autoplay for one of one of my coming up videos. Okay. This is how seriously we take it. Look at this this shot. Like, so I have this fully rendered out. This is just the intro for okay. our next video. Uh oh yeah, you, you probably saw it yesterday. Yeah, yeah, we saw so this. this. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. this is the autoplay. See, that's oh my God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got that's, it. Got so, it. So, oh wait, so all you have on your phone is the autoplay. Yeah, is that, that's what's gonna play. It's the and, first five seconds. Exactly. Like, and, and so, you make sure the first five seconds looks like the thumbnail. Of course. Okay. So before you do, you film a video. What is the thumbnail? What is the video? And then what's the first five seconds? And then what's the first thirty seconds? You know, by the first yeah. five seconds, it's like goes with the thumbnail because it's possible that people open YouTube and they, they don't see it. They don't Especially see it for us that. because like for so many people I've watched hundreds of our videos when I upload, I am first on your homepage. So like you, you just literally don't even see the thumbnail because mm. wow. it auto plays so quickly. So it, like the thumbnail is irrelevant. I have to like visually convince you to click on the video. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah, that's why we go so hardcore. Mm. Dude, that's so crazy. So do you consider also captions in those first five seconds? Because people course, aren't watching with yeah, audio. Everything. Yeah. everything, yes, 100%. Mm. Wow, so those first five seconds, that hook is now even more important than it ever used to be. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. before it was important because you had to convince people to watch. Yeah. Now you have to convince people to click and watch at the same time. Whoa. With the first five seconds. That's driving CTR now too. Yeah, it interesting. is, 100%. Wow. So hooks are not only meaningful, but they are now more important than ever. No pressure. To help us out, Mr. Beast was kind enough to lay out his top advice for hooks. Check it out. Essentially, your title and thumbnail set expectations. And at the very beginning of the video, to minimize drop off, you want to assure them that those expectations are being met. If you click on a video where, you know, uh, of his, where it's like, tether is a scam, and then at the very beginning, he starts talking about literally anything else. Then you are like, oh, this is bull. This isn't what I clicked on. But if at the very start of the video, you go, Tether is a scam, and I'm going to teach you why, then it's like, okay, you match the expectations. So at the very beginning, match the expectations, and then you want to exceed them. So you want to assure people that what they clicked on is what they're getting, and then blow their mind and be like, what? You're also getting even more. That's how you, you lower drop off, which a lot of people, sometimes it takes them like 20 seconds to really meet the expectations. And so you lose, like, that's where you're gonna lose everyone. Everyone's videos start like this, and then it levels off. So you wanna reduce the amount of people that click off on the audience retention graph. So for a Mr. Beast approved hook in the first seconds of your videos, don't just match the expectations of your title and thumbnail, but exceed those expectations. And don't take too long while you do it and don't leave in any fluff. Take a look at an example here. After we uh, hung out yesterday, I went back and watched the FBI video again. And I uh -huh. watched the first 40 seconds and I was sitting with Colin showing him like a lot of what we talked about, I was seeing in those first 40 <laughs> seconds. And I was like, you really do all those things. And mm -hmm. those first 40 seconds were so jam packed and you introduced so many new things, <laughs> yeah. like so much new stuff between both the visuals too. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the, the, the concept that you say in the first 40 seconds, first of all, the visuals are already changing, but you also say there's an NFL stadium, there's a private jet, exactly. and there's a maze. This is why you should watch the video. Yeah. See these things. Yeah. Yeah. And like the, the thing people undervalue the most is literally the first 10 seconds of the video. Like, yeah, I can almost I think I can quote it. Uh, I tied up an FBI agent. And I have one hundred thousand dollars in this bag. Here's a knife. Good luck. And I just run away. Yeah. Like it gives you everything you need. Yeah. No wasted words, short, concise, and then tension. Across more of his interviews, Mr. Beast also mentioned that hooks with brighter lighting tended to do better than hooks with darker lighting. And that the more cuts, clips, or camera angles that you could include in the first 30 seconds, the better. But unfortunately, the work doesn't stop there. Because after the hook comes the rest of the video. And for that, we're going to have to take a look at retention. One of the most viral clips from Mr. Beast's interview came from a conversation around retention check it out but actually yeah. you know how we were talking about dylan earlier yeah so he just said i'm getting close to 70 percent i'm almost a decent youtuber he sent me a graph <laughs> wow. or his new video 
had a sixty-five percent retention. Oh wow! Because I told him Great. if he doesn't yeah. get seventy percent retention on a video, then he didn't do something right. Wow! I don't even <laughs> want to pull up our retention. <laughs> Yeah, 70%. Yeah, yeah. That's what you need. If it's below that, figure out how to get higher. You heard the man. If you want a Mr. Beast approved video, you need to reach 70% retention. <laughs> how do you get to 70% retention? Here are some of Mr. Beast's top retention advice. You basically want to remove every dull moment. You probably want to find the 10 most critical people you know, make them watch the video and just roast it. You want to, I personally, I enjoy <laughs> I enjoy having people watch the videos and watching them. There's some things you can do where like, you can basically pay people to watch the videos on frame and then just have them record it. And I love just seeing like when they pick up their phones and when they get bored and like, you know, certain things like if I just talk to a camera for 10 seconds without a cut, like a lot of people will just like get bored or they'll lose interest. So like having a B cam and a C cam and just, you can just talk for 10 seconds, but three seconds in cutting to a B cam and then a C cam, like now it's more interesting, even though it's essentially the same thing and not that crazy, but you want to have good pacing. Typically having a payoff at the end keeps some, right? Last leave circle wins 10 grand. If there is a low moment halfway through, you're going to watch to the end because you want to see who wins the 10 grand. Um, so having a good payoff at the end. That's pretty much a masterclass in retention, right? Remove dull moments, get your videos roasted, see where people get bored while watching and have a big payoff at the end. Interestingly enough though, if you have longer videos, sometimes one big payoff at the end still isn't enough. Mr. Beast talks about it here. It's very hard with a single storyline if you're doing like a double digit minute video to just have that one thing grip their entire attention throughout the whole video and pay off at the end. Um, so typically if you're doing a longer video, you should introduce like a side story and like re you should have some plan halfway through like to re-engage them so they don't just get bored. You know what I mean? Like if I just said, like if I hand you a camera and I had a camera, it's like, okay, if he tags me, he gets a hundred grand and then I just run and that's it. It's just me running through the woods and him just running through the woods after me. You can't make a 15 minute video out of it. You know what I mean? But if I do that and then like three minutes in, I pull a lever and a bear comes out and starts chasing <laughs> him and he has to get away from the bear. I don't know. Obviously we wouldn't do this, but kill the bear. <laughs> and then he starts chasing me. And then six minutes in, I jump across the lake. And as he goes to jump through, I press a button that shoots him to the moon, whatever. You know what I mean? Like. Now all of a sudden it's interesting and you're watching, right? And that's it, right? One is just a single story and it's boring. The other has side stories that like re-engage people. If that seems like a lot of work to keep videos engaging, you are absolutely right. But hey, no one said this whole YouTube thing would be easy. The good news though, is that once you have people engaged, you don't have to try as hard for the rest of the video because they're already invested. Mr. Beast talks about this effect here. What's interesting is the longer people watch something, the more likely they are to keep watching. So you don't have to try as hard in the hypothetically back half of a video as you do in the front. Like even right now, we're so deep into this where a lot of people listening are probably just going to keep listening relatively close to the end unless we just have a really boring part of this conversation because they're just, they're just in it. They're, they're immersed. Um, and so a big, like to really boil it down to a simple level, you just want to get people where they're immersed in the content and then just kind of hold them there. So to get a Mr. Beast approved video, have a fantastic hook, remove every dull moment, have a big payoff and implement side narratives to get your videos up to 70% retention. But why does this retention matter so much? Why is hitting 70% so much better than say 50? Well, it boils down to what YouTube wants. I'll turn it over to Mr. Beast to explain here. So at the end of the day, if you boil it down, what YouTube wants is they want people to click on a video and they want to watch it. Like at its core, that's what it is. Now you can like draw little lines and go as deep as you want into how to get people to click and how to get people to watch. I mean, essentially by studying the algorithm, you'll learn that you're more studying human psychology, right? What do humans want to watch? What do they find enjoying? Not because like, anytime you say the word algorithm, just replace it with audience and it works perfectly. Like the algorithm didn't like that video. No, the audience didn't like that video. Mm. Now, you know, because literally that's it. If people are clicking and watching, then it gets promoted more. And that's all, that's literally all the algorithm does is reflect what the people want. So that's why a high retention matters. Because if on average people are watching 70% of your videos, that sends a strong signal that, hey, 
people really like this video and this video should get recommended to more and more people because on the balance of probability, they'll probably like it. So that's how Mr. Beast approaches the YouTube algorithm. He doesn't spend a lot of time diving into each and every teeny tiny little detail. In practically every one of his interviews, he said that all YouTube wants is for people to click on videos and watch them. And that's truly what he focuses on. So there, definitive proof that you don't have to spend countless hours diving deep into the inner workings of the YouTube algorithm in order to be successful on YouTube. According to Mr. Beast, the only things you need to worry about are, are people clicking? Are people watching all the way through? And do people keep watching more? And if you're struggling with any one of these components, that's okay, Mr. Beast did too. But everything changed when he got himself some creator friends. Take a look. Most of my growth came actually after uh, I graduated high school. Basically what I did was I f somehow found these other like four lunatics. We were, three of us were college dropouts. One was a high school dropout. And one, I don't know, he just like quit his job. We were all super small YouTubers. And we basically talked every day for a thousand days in a row and did nothing but just like hyper study like what makes a good video, what makes a good thumbnail, what what's good pacing, like how to go viral. And we would just call it like daily masterminds. We would just get on Skype every morning and like some days like I'd get on Skype at 7 a.m. and I'd be in the call until like 10 p.m. and then I'd go to bed and I'd wake up and I'd do it again. And oh, you know, we'd do things like just take a thousand thumbnails and see if like there's a correlation to the brightness of the thumbnail to how many views it got. Or like, you know, like videos that get over 10 million views is like, how often do they cut the camera angles or like things like that? Like we were very religious about it. And so that's that's where most of my knowledge came from is I just surround myself with these lunatics and just every day, like we didn't do anything. We had no life. Uh, but everybody had sort of a similar vision. Yeah, exactly. So we all had like 10, 20,000 subscribers when we met. And by the time we stopped talking, we all had millions of subscribers. And we, we all hit a million subscribers like within a month. It's crazy. Cause it's like, if you envision a world where you're trying to be great at something, and it's just like, you mess up, you learn from your mistake, you mess up, you learn from your mistake. You in two years, you know, might have learned from 20 mistakes. Or if you have like four other people who are also messing up and when they uh, learn from the mistake, they teach you what they learn. Stuff like that. Hypothetically, you two years down the road have learned like five times more of the amount of stuff. So it just like helps you grow exponentially way quicker. Every time Mr. Beast has been asked in interviews how he grew on YouTube or what factors most contributed to his success, he always mentions his creator friend group. And when it comes to the impact that those friends made, well, listen to Mr. Beast. Just all along the way, the friends that I hung out with had such a dramatic impact on, on where I am. Like I, I'd probably have 80 million less subscribers, you know, if it was, if I wasn't so strategic about hanging out with people that I add value to and they also add value to me. Even though Mr. Beast was hyper obsessed with YouTube from the very beginning of his YouTube journey, he still attributes the majority of his success to being surrounded by other smart YouTubers. So there you have it. If you're trying to go at this whole YouTube thing alone, you're putting yourself at a severe disadvantage. So if you don't have friends, make friends. God, I need to make some friends. The last main takeaway I'll share from binge watching countless hours of Mr. Beast interviews goes out to all my fellow small YouTubers out there because Mr. Beast has some advice just for us. And honestly, it really changed the way that I think about YouTube. There's no visual for this one, but take a listen. The best way to get views, in my opinion, I think it's better to really, really focus on quality if you're a very small YouTuber and you can upload a video a day and like all the videos be average. And like none of those videos will really stand out. None of it's like epic enough where like the algorithm's gonna go, oh, this video, like this video is good. Like we need to spread it. I feel like a lot of small YouTubers, they just post like videos that aren't bad, but they're not great. And they just do that. And, and none of them ever pop off. So they never get an audience where it might be better to like, you know, upload half or a third or even like a fifth of the videos, but make the videos you upload so freaking good that like the algorithm has to promote it and that, you know, it has to find audiences for it because it's such an interesting and good video. When you like set a consistent schedule and you're constantly having to upload videos that aren't as good as you'd like because you got to hit, oh, this Monday, I said I'd upload every Monday, you know, like that's a dangerous trap because then, you know, the viewers notice that the quality isn't as good and it makes them less likely to watch and I think it hurts your longevity. Dang, doesn't that just hit so hard? If you don't know, I am a small YouTuber and I'm on this crazy challenge to get my channel monetized within 90 days. I'm currently on week two and prior to this Mr. Beast interview binge, my game plan to reach my goal was to upload three long form videos per week. That way I'd get a ton of videos in, a ton of reps in and have a greater chance of one of my videos popping off. But now I don't think it's smart to think of YouTube from a purely numbers game. I might be a bit overconfident here, but I don't think my video 
videos are bad. That being said, I don't think they're knock your socks off fantastic either. In his interviews, Mr. Beast frequently emphasized the importance of a large number of uploads. But it's not just about uploading videos. There's another key ingredient in there too, one that I was overlooking. Take a look. All you need to do is make 100 videos and improve something every time. Do that. And then on your 101st video, we'll start talking, like maybe you can get some views, but you know, your first 100 are gonna stop. There are very freak cases like Liza Koshi or Emma Chamberlain who have really good personalities and it doesn't take them so as many videos. And it's just like people who are seven foot five and making the NBA. Like, yes, there are freak cases you can find, but for the average person like us, you know, who don't have these exceptional personalities and, you know, backgrounds in filmmaking, just make 100 videos, improve something each time, and then talk to me on your 101st video. Well, the improve something each time is the tricky one. How do you improve something each time? The second one, just, I don't know, put more effort into the script. The third one, try to learn a new editing trick. The fourth one, try to figure out a way that you can have better inflections in your voice. The fifth one, try to, you know, study a new thumbnail tip and implement it. The sixth one, try to figure out a new title. There's yeah. infinite ways. That's the beauty of content creation online. There's literally infinite ways from the coloring to the frame rate, to the editing, to the filming, to the production, to the jokes, to the pacing, to every little thing can be improved and they can never not be improved. There's no, no there's literally no such thing as a perfect video. Yes, we need to make videos. That's why we're here on YouTube to make videos. But just as importantly, if not more importantly, we need to to improve with each and every video. There's obviously a balance here. You don't want to wait for three months in between uploads because you want to get everything absolutely perfect. But at least for me, I realized that I was so obsessed with making new videos and keeping to my upload schedule no matter what, that I just didn't have the space and the time to improve with every video. Yes, I could improve small things here and there, but when every one of my waking hours is dedicated to making new videos, I don't have time to view my videos critically, to look at my retention to see where people are dropping off and do everything else that would dramatically improve the quality of my videos. So if you're a small YouTuber like me, I hope that that's the main takeaway from this crazy video. Yes, there are a million things that you can apply from Mr. Beast's advice, but the main one should be to keep making videos and keep improving with every video. And hey, if you want to follow along my YouTube monetization journey and see if I actually make it, I'm uploading real-time weekly updates with what's working, what's not working, my strategy is, what I'm experimenting with, and all that jazz. If that's something that interests you, you can check out my most recent update here. Otherwise, thank you so, so much for watching. I hope you found this video useful. Give it a thumbs up and a subscribe if you can, and I will see you in the next video.